Hello, I'm Ryan Baker, and today I'll be talking about improving automated detection of student disengagement and affect. In recent years, more and more learning occurs in interactive learning environments, be they games, simulations, first-person environments, or intelligent tutoring systems or classic homework platforms. Some of these systems are used by tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of students per year. And some of these systems can be very engaging, but there's a lot of variation in how engaging these systems can be. For example, if we look across studies that measure student boredom, we can see that some learning platforms, students are bored more than 20% of the time, and other learning platforms, it's as low as one or 2%. And what systems are boring and engaging isn't always obvious. For example, the second most boring platform in our research was Math Blaster, an award-winning game. Turns out actually it's not nearly as fun as the people who gave it its awards thought. Now this is important because affect and engagement in online learning predicts student outcomes, even several years later. And because of that, there's increasing work to develop measures that are automated, able to make assessments about students in real time with no human in the loop, <clears throat> fine-grained, able to make assessments about students at a second-by-second -second level, and validated, demonstrated to apply to new students and new contexts. So this creates some opportunities. Can we develop systems that recognize when a student is becoming disengaged and adapt to improve engagement? Can we assess which materials are less engaging to drive redesign? And can we determine which students are less engaged to provide predictive analytics? The primary goal of this work, detect engagement solely from student interactions with software. Why no sensors? Why not uh, galvanic skin response bracelets and EEG pendants? Well, Sensors raise privacy, political costs, and equity concerns that can be difficult to address. It's not that they're not valuable. Sensors actually can be quite variable. Um, for example, our work has done some, um, our group has done some work to integrate interaction-based and sensor-based detectors. We found that interaction-based detectors in some cases are better, but in some cases they're not as good, even though they have added a value. However, interaction-based detectors are usable in many situations where video-based detectors are ineffective. Students who turn their heads students who wear baseball caps and tilt their heads down, students who chew gum. Uh, if we can't prevent students from chewing gum and drinking water while learning, uh, sensor-based video, at least, can be difficult to use. Nonetheless, there's a lot of value to video and to other sensors, but there's limitations as well, which is why our lab is mostly focused on interaction-based. The primary constructs that we model include off-task behavior, when a student completely disengages from the learning environment and the task to engage in an unrelated behavior. Gaming the system, intentionally misusing educational software to complete problems and advance without learning. That can include behaviors like systematic guessing. For example, one time when I was out in a classroom, I saw a student type one and it was wrong. They typed two and it was wrong. They typed three, wrong, four, wrong, five, wrong, six, wrong, all the way to 38, which was finally the correct answer and the system let them move on. Um, hint abuse. Um, when a student is using a system that gives hints that ultimately tell you the answer, and the student goes click, 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 type in the answer. Click, 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 type in the answer. Hint, 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 type in the answer. These are behaviors that lead to the student completing problems and appearing to advance, but they're not behaviors that lead to learning. Careless errors. Making errors despite knowing the relevant skills or concepts. A lot of people think that careless errors aren't that important, but in fact, they have over a decade-long longitudinal predictive power for what career students go in. If you become careless in middle school math, you're less likely to take a job in middle school math. Sorry, you're less likely to take a job in math after college. Affect, um, engage concentration, positive focus concentration on the task, boredom, frustration, confusion, uh, in game-based environments, we've also detected delight. How do we do this? First, we get human assessments of engagement and disengagement synchronized to the log files from educational software. Then we use data mining to develop models that can replicate those human judgments using just log files. Now, the way we obtained our ground truth, the way we obtained our training labels for many years has been really difficult in 2020, and it'll probably stay difficult in 2021. We used a method called BROMP field observations, uh, the Baker-Rodrigo-Ocampo monitoring protocol. And we conducted them 
through an Android app named Heart, which is available free to anyone who wants to use it. Um, BROMP is a protocol designed to collect data on student engagement and emotion while reducing disruption to the student. Some features of the protocol include observing with peripheral vision or side glances. We have a nice picture of that here. If you look at her eyes down there, um, you can see that she is looking in a certain direction, but she's actually observing the student right in front of her. Um, hovering over a student not being observed uh, when necessary to hover over a student. 20 second round robin observations of several students. Bored looking people are boring. So um, I, don't I don't necessarily dress up in such an exciting uh, floral outfit when I'm in a classroom. I uh, dress in gray, I move slowly, I look bored and unhappy like I'm messing with my phone. And because I look bored and unhappy and uninteresting, students don't look at me, so they don't notice when I'm observing them. Um, over 150 coders have now been trained in six countries for uh, BROMP, and they've achieved, each of them, integrated reliability around 0.8 for behavior and around 0.65 for affect. <clears throat> so our first approach to building automated detectors, I guess I call it classic because we use classic algorithms, not because we consider ourselves a classic, is first, we synchronize log data field observations. We then distill meaningful data features for the learning environment. And we do this feature engineering process based on a qualitative study of the log files, the experience of our field observers, and past experience with other data sets. We then develop an automated detector using a classification algorithm, and we validate the detector for new students, new content, and new populations of learners. <clears throat> we assess our models using a combination of metrics, including the area under the ROC curve, Cohen's kappa, and precision recall curves, especially when we're trying to decide a threshold for intervention. We've built these detectors for a variety of different learning environments, including intelligent tutoring systems, games, simulations, first-person environments, uh, programming IDEs even. I'll give a quick example from the assessments platform, where we observed over 500 students in six schools making over 3,600 observations. Across these six schools, we collected a diverse population of urban, suburban, and rural students who ranged from very low per capita income to average per capita. So in our first approach to modeling in this data set, we used classic algorithms like decision trees, decision rules, instance-based classification, functional classification. Our models varied in quality. So our, our worst performing model was boredom with a rather mediocre AUCROC of 0.63. Uh, when looking at AFEC, we got up to a uh, AUCROC of 0.736 for confusion. And then off-test behavior in gaming the system, we got up a little bit over 0.8. Now, we were worst at boredom in assessments, but I don't want to give the impression that boredom is where we're generally worst. Actually, it varies a lot between learning environments. For example, in the vMedic um, uh, first responder virtual reality system, boredom detection was best with an AUCROC in the midpoint eights. <clears throat> now, one technical detail from assessments that I think is worth bringing up is that models trained only on students from a single population, be it urban, suburban, or rural, work well on new students from that population, but they're inappropriate for different populations where they perform just barely better than chance. <clears throat> we then tried building a model on uh, students from all three populations. We found that it worked just as well as the single population model for our urban and our suburban students, but it still didn't work very well for the rural students. To get an effective model for the rural students, we had to build on the rural students themselves. and We still test on other rural students, but part of what this tells you is that you can't just build on a convenience population for these kind of models and expect it to work for other learners. You've got to have your uh, training set be representative. And you know this, this felt like a very novel thing in 2014. It doesn't feel novel now with the focus on algorithmic bias, but educational researchers and developers still aren't paying particularly much attention to rural students. So this seems to be a group that we need to pay some attention. Going forward, we tried moving to deep learning. We've tried a couple approaches. In the same assessments platform I just talked about a minute ago, we've tried doing RNNs and RNN LSTMs. And in the Betty's Brain uh, concept mapping learning environment, we tried using an autoencoder prior to using some classic algorithms. 
I'll talk first briefly about our work to use RNN LSTM assessments, where we built a recurrent neural long short-term memory network in Python, um, relatively standard parameters. And we found that for the various affective states, uh, we had considerably better performance on new students. So for example, for boredom, we went from an AUCRC of 0.63 to an AUCRC of 0.8. Uh, frustration, we had a 0.08 improvement, engaged concentration, a 0.12 improvement. Ironically, for confusion, we actually dropped by 0.02. So it wasn't universally better, but there was definitely a trend towards the models being more successful. In Betty's brain, we tried using a gated recurrent unit neural network in Python, and we compared it to traditional feature engineering. We actually had uh, one researcher experience in using feature engineering, doing the feature engineering part, and another researcher experience in doing autoencoders, doing the autoencoding part. We found that uh, actually we got slightly higher AUCROC for uh, the feature engineering for most constructs than the autoencoder. Um, neither model was fantastic for this environment. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, but the autoencoder definitely didn't seem to be a magic bullet kind of solution unless you were looking at the light where it was actually about uh, 0.08 better. So to summarize, We've been successful at detecting disengaged behavior and affect in several learning environments just from interaction data. And uh, we've been using classic machine learning algorithms, but we've also been trying um, deep learning. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't been a magic bullet yet. Our recent work has attempted to improve our models using deep learning. There's some appearance of promise. There's still no home run and our work is continuing. Some ongoing work. Can we get better results if we combine autoencoders with feature engineering? In other words, our work in Betty's brain either used feature engineering or autoencoders. What if we try both? Um, another uh, piece of ongoing work, which has been a little painful for us because we have a decade of successful work in this paradigm, but for some of our recent projects, we're changing over to self-report labels due to COVID-19. When you can't go to the classroom, it kind of gives you broadly the choice of self-report or the choice of video coding. We decided in this case to go with self-report again because we're a little worried about privacy issues, especially as we start to post cameras in people's homes. We see people's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, speaking here from uh, the scenic, my son's room, um, because I don't have a big enough house. But this is kind of what happens and there are privacy issues. So we've been switching over to self-report labels. Um, we're hoping we can switch back to field observations in a couple of years because we like field observations a lot better. It's easier to get reliability indicators, um, and you don't suffer from uh, the kind of issues that self-report has around presentation bias and demand effects. But that's where we're at. Um, as we change over to self-report labels, we're working with Andrew Lan at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to use active learning to facilitate data collection and development of models for a new learning context. The idea being that we can't ask people for a self-report every five minutes. That will just be horribly miserable for students, and we don't always know when the right time is. So if, if we can only ask a student, say, once a day or once a week, there's not actually clear literature on how often you can ask students before you annoy the heck out of them and cause problems. If we can only collect a label occasionally, can we have our model collect that label at the best possible time that day or week uh, so we get the best information? So thank you all for coming to this virtual talk. If you're interested in learning more, um, all of our publications are available online. Google Ryan Baker. I'm not the news anchor or the footballer. We have a massive online open course, Big Data in Education, which is available for free still. Uh, also, all the videos are up on YouTube. On My webpage has a collection of them. Um, and we have a low traffic Twitter and Facebook feed where we post all of our latest scientific results. Thank you very much for coming to the talk, and I look forward to future conversations with you. Have a great day. Excellent, we're back. Actually, um, uh, that was great. Actually, uh, and we have the man himself here, um, Ryan. Actually, so what's next for you? Oh boy, um, I so many things, right? Like I've got so many projects I'm excited about. I don't know where to start. Um, just today, uh, Neil, I was talking about new project ideas with uh, our colleague Seth. Um, I don't know. Uh, 
you know, build detectors using self-report, um, figure out how to handle the, all the data changes we've got with COVID, especially with school information systems. Like there's just so much going on. I, uh, I'm working on a review of algorithmic bias with Aaron Hahn. Like there's the so many fun things to work on. Excellent. Well, hey, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and there's a question in the chat from David Kim, actually, and maybe you might be able to help me answer that. Uh, and But I'm going to queue up the next Exley panel because uh, I'm a little bit behind time. Uh, but our next panel actually is actually being hosted by Kumar Garg, uh, and I'm going to go right to that now. Thank you. Oh, then I'll answer in the live stream. Thank you.